Well, good morning. Thank you so much for having me with you here today. Uh, like Ben said, my name is Jordy, but I'm a bit more of a geek than I am an athlete, so I go more for LaForge than Nelson. Um, no, my name is Jordy Denholm. I'm a um, pastor uh, at Jefferson Avenue Mission, our worshiping community about a mile and point uh, two from here um, as we replant um, out of Emmaus Lutheran Church. Um, Let's take a minute. We have two longer readings, so do a little bit of shake if you need to. Make sure you're still with me this morning. Um, and then join me for a word in prayer to center our hearts and to center our minds. Almighty and Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, uh, for the sunshine you bless us with, for the sh fellowship you give to us here in this place and Lord, all of the blessings and forgiveness you continue to shower upon us. So we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Like I said, our readings this morning were a little bit longer than they are typically. So I got to be honest, we're going to be focusing on the text from Acts this morning, but in my process this week, I have written at least four drafts of this script this morning. I have spent my time trying to pick apart what it is I want to share with you and either focus too narrowly or I did too much of a scatter shot and tried to cover everything. Uh, Kara said that this is my perfect opportunity to then give four mini sermons, but I'm not going to put you through that. So I, I distilled it down into one. And all of that is to say that if there's something in the readings this morning that sticks out to you that I don't cover, or if I, you have farther questions about something that God is putting on your heart, please find me afterwards. I'd love to spend a little bit more time with you and chat. Uh, but like I said, we are, we're going to be looking at that uh, text from Acts this morning. Uh, it's famously called the conversion of St. Paul, but in the story he is still named Saul. Uh, and as we take a look at this conversion, it seems a bit fantastical, doesn't it? Uh, it seems like Pastor Nathan said throughout the season of Lent, these are stories that seem a little bit removed from us, detached almost to the point of unbelievable, because this is not how we experience the world these days. This is not how we experience Jesus or the church or how we see Christians converted, at least not for the most part. And speaking of, that word itself has quite some baggage to it, doesn't it? A conversion or, or convert? Uh, I think that in our world today, that word has a, a negative connotation to it that, that a lot of people just can't get past. You see, it's a common word, but it, it's pretty complicated. It, but stripping away everything else, it, it simply means to change, to change from one thing to a different thing. And yet I would say that in America, if you were to talk about conversion or converting, uh, well, they're going to think of something different, right? Now, oftentimes our culture thinks that to convert somebody means to, to pester them with your beliefs, your uh, opinions, your ideology so much that they relent, that they change their ideas, change their behavior. Uh, to our culture, conversion is a lot more about that ideology, a lot more about that behavior than it is the flesh and blood human on the other side of that conversation. What they care for and what they believe and stand for. But maybe, right, just maybe, as with so many other things, the world has this word wrong. Maybe, in fact, we have this word wrong. See, I think spiritual conversion doesn't happen in the course of a battle of wits. It doesn't come in a contest of wills, but spiritual conversion comes when a broken, sinful human being has an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ, with his message of forgiveness, life, and salvation. 
No, it's, it, it's not a competition. It's not a contest. It's not about trying to bring more people into this building to pad our numbers and look better. No, it is a change, a transformation of the heart through an encounter with Jesus Christ. And that's what we see in our text this morning, isn't it? Uh, we see this man named Saul. Now, this is the third time that Saul appears in the book of Acts. Uh, the first time he shows up, it's at the stoning of St. Stephen, where, where Saul is mentioned as just standing there holding the cloaks of all of these men who are grabbing rocks to do this terrible deed. Uh, but to stand by and observe is not enough for Saul. He takes the next step, and, and he says uh, the next time he shows up, he's, he goes throughout Jerusalem. And it says that he ravages the church. He, he breaks down doors. He, he drags people into the streets, binds them up, puts them on trial, and throws them in jail. But he wasn't content staying in Jerusalem either. No, Saul thinks that his mission is bigger. And so he wants to get outside of the capital city and go to the next largest city around, which is Damascus. And he gets permission to do so. He goes to the chief priest and asks for all of this authority to go and basically do what he would like and drag these Christians back. Uh, the same authority, I might say, that were the very ones that put Jesus to death a few short weeks ago. Uh, the same authorities that, as we talked about through Lent, are believing they're doing good, just like Saul is believing he's doing good. He thinks that he's silencing this blasphemy, uh, that he's putting down this heresy that is infecting his religion, his praise of the Lord God Almighty. In short, as we said in Lent, he is doing evil, in the name of God. Thank goodness that God has other plans, right? Because as Saul goes about, Saul, this man who hated Jesus, hated his followers and was doing everything he could to actively stop the spreading of this, this great news, this good news. No, Saul gets knocked to the ground. He's blinded. And then he's given other instructions to follow, just to, to sit and listen and wait to hear. Now, there have been a number of terrible humans throughout history that have been enemies of the gospel. There have been number, uh, numerous, uh, countless people who have fought against the church, sought to silence it, sought to end it. And yet, for some reason, Saul is the one that God chooses in this moment. Uh, Saul is the one to, to change through the power of God and instead be turned to a completely different path as we see, right? And so God knocks him to the ground, like I said, questions him, blinds him, and then sends him along. Basically says, wait there. Now put yourself in Saul's shoes for a moment, right? You have to be terrified, you see, Saul worshipped the, the Lord God Almighty, I am who I am, right? That he's worshipping the God of scriptures, which at that time was only the Old Testament as we have it now. And so Saul has to be thinking, well, in, in our scriptures, when God is angry with somebody, it doesn't end well for them, does it? There's countless stories of that throughout the Old Testament. And here you are defenseless, led by the hand into a city you thought you'd be riding into proud with your head held high, and now you are alone sitting in your own weakness. So thank goodness we have a God that in our times of greatest weakness often show us his strength and his great might. Because then we're introduced to this man named Ananias, right? Which every single time on here I spell differently. Uh, we're introduced to Ananias and, and God comes to Ananias and he says, hey, go heal this man. And again, rightfully so, Ananias is terrified. Uh, he talks back to God, right? He says, God, this is the man who's been doing evil. This is the man who has come here to arrest me and arrest my friends. 
God, this man wants me dead and wants the story of your son to be silenced. Why in the world would I go heal him? And again, as we see so often, God doesn't have time for this nonsense. Right? God is so sick of his creation, you and me, uh, doubting his commands or disobeying his plans. Flip it, reverse that. And so he says this, and listen to it again. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Now, maybe Ananias didn't have anything to say back to that. Maybe Ananias liked that part about suffering. Uh, but something in Ananias' heart changed as well. And so he goes and he heals Saul. And then we see Saul's life do a complete 180, don't we? It changes drastically in the matter of one little verse in a moment that was probably about five minutes in real time. Uh, because Ananias comes, he lays his hand on him, uh, he heals his sight, and then it says immediately he rose and was baptized. That God changed his heart to now live for him. Uh, later, Saul will, like I said, change his name to Paul, right? He becomes St. Paul, who, who we know writes most of the books in what we now call the New Testament. He goes from the Christianity's public enemy number one to Jesus' biggest fanboy, right? Nobody, uh, we could say, has, has a faith like Paul's at that time. He, he writes and he travels, and like God says, he is the one to carry the name before the Gentiles. By the way, that's me and you to carry the name before the kings, right? He goes to Rome and, and has conversations with uh, the most powerful of powerful men at that time and even the children of Israel. As he does just a little bit later, going into the synagogue and saying that Jesus is Lord. That's quite a transformation. That kind of change only happens when a broken and sinful human encounter the risen Lord Jesus, doesn't it? So what about us then, right? How, how do we relate to this story? I mean, most of us don't have a conversion experience like Paul. I, maybe, I, I, I don't know. Uh, but if I had to guess, most of our stories are a lot more subtle. We don't see as many miracles these days. Uh, we don't see as many visions these days. And so, what does Saul have for us? And first, I've got a few points to bring this a little bit closer to our own hearts. First, notice that when Ananias goes to Saul, there's almost no conversation in the healing and conversion. There's, there's almost nothing that happens other than Ananias coming in, saying, brother, I'm here to heal you, laying on his hands, and he is healed. And what I'm trying to say is, we're called to spread the word of God, right? We're called to sow the seeds of the gospel, to go and make disciples, but I need to tell you uh, that it's not you. It's not your words, and so don't you dare try to convince yourself that you will be the one to change another person's heart. Oh, it might be changed. And believe me, God does work through each and every one of us, but don't kid yourself, it's not you. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of our Almighty God that healed Saul, that has healed all of us. And maybe... Just maybe that if you're going into a conversation like that with your guns blazing, uh, if you're trying to dismantle their beliefs or, or correct their behavior, then maybe it's your own motivation that needs a conversion first. Maybe we all need to remember that, that when we're having a conversation with somebody who is not a believer, that they are bearers of God's image. Uh, children that are also loved by that Savior that need to hear of that love now from your very mouth. 
so that the Holy Spirit can do its work. Second, I would like to, uh, I mentioned this earlier, but I want to talk about our own conversions. Uh, Like I said, it's probably a lot more subtle than Paul's. I, I don't think any of you were knocked down in the streets by a bright light, but I don't know. But at some point, each of us has a conversion of their own. Uh, for, for you, for those who might have been raised in the church, baptized from an early age and always living, there's a point in your life, isn't there, uh, that it stopped being just your parents' faith and it became your own. Maybe it was confirmation, maybe it was a youth event or summer camp or something, but at some point you said, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior. And everything has been different since then. And more than that, I, I think that conversion is not just a one-time thing. We, we said it earlier in our, uh, as we spoke together, but, but I would say that conversion happens each and every day. Uh, that as we uh, encounter our God, as we uh, receive his forgiveness that he offers to us, our hearts are continually changed, converted from hearts of stubborn stone to hearts of flesh, hearts that seek out and desire his will, his good and perfect and pleasing will for our lives, hearts that desire the kingdom of God, to gather with our brothers and sisters and to live that forgiveness. Indeed, conversion happens anew each and every morning. In fact, St. Paul, uh, Saul, later St. Paul, will write in the book of Corinthians that when we approach the table of the Lord, when we as disciples encounter our Savior through his flesh and through his blood, that we ought to examine ourselves that we ought to turn our hearts back to the path that God has laid before us. Lives of forgiveness, lives of joy. Yes, lives of suffering as we see Paul will go through, but, but lives that also have the comfort of a family around us. Which is our last point. You notice that Ananias' response to meeting Saul Uh, After he gets past the fear and anxiety, after he he gets past the, well, why would I save this man? What does he say? He walks in, he lays his hands on him, and, and instead of berating him for the things he did, instead of scorning him or hating him or or healing him and leaving, he says, brother. Brother, I have been sent. To regain, uh, so that you might regain your sight and receive the Holy Spirit. You see, once we are converted, once our hearts change, we are no longer left alone. Instead, God picks us up, says, you are mine, and then he places us in a family of believers, a family that we call brothers and sisters, and on the other side, call us brothers and sisters to care for us, to walk with us, to show us and remind us that we are loved and forgiven, especially and maybe more uh, intensely during those times of suffering, those times of trial and hardship where we are together as one body in Christ. So maybe this morning you're feeling a little bit more like Saul, right? Right? Maybe you're struggling with something in your heart and you're saying, God, I need a change. God, I need a conversion. And so I say to you that if God can forgive a man like Saul, right, the biggest enemy of the church who who persecuted not only the followers, but as Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Then God can forgive whatever it is you're holding on to everything and anything that you're holding on to. But you do have to let it go. You do have to turn your heart to his will. But maybe this morning, that's not the case. Maybe this morning you're feeling a little bit more like Ananias. And maybe there's fear in your heart about going and evangelizing, of sharing your story. Or maybe there's fear for, or, or hatred in your heart for somebody else that God has called 
to tell you to, that God has told you to call brother or sister. In which case, I want to encourage you in that. To remind you that the other person is a bearer of God's image, despite what they've done to you, despite what they might still continue to be doing to you, Jesus says, love your enemies. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. So maybe there is somebody in your life that you need to go, put your hand on their shoulder and call brother or sister. See, because when we get out of God's way, uh, when, we, when we let go of the things we're holding on to and, and let God have a way with our hearts, that's when we see true transformation happen. That's when we can see our own lives do a full 180. It might not be as dr drastic as Paul's, but it sure doesn't mean that it's less impactful or less meaningful. When we get out of God's way, the whole world through our actions, through our deeds, can see that life, forgiveness, and salvation. When our hearts are changed, converted, whatever word you want to use, uh, it's in that moment that we begin to live differently. It's that moment that we love differently because we are loved. Loved by a God who would send his own son to the cross in our place so that then we can be sent out into the world, out to our brothers and sisters, whether they're in this room or whether we haven't met them yet, so that more hearts can be converted, so that more lives can be transformed. Brothers and sisters, I think we have some conversion to experience our own and others around us, all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.